Hello and welcome. The Russia Seminar 2021 will continue. The evening in Helsinki session will consider, uh, consist of, of two presentations which will be given by the, our American colleagues. Uh, the first one will be presented by Michael Kaufman, who is a director in the uh, of the Russian Studies program at the CNA and the Kennan Institute Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center. He has served previously at National Defense University as a program manager. His research focuses on, on security issues on, in Russia and in Eurasia, and he has published numerous articles on the Russian military. Today, his title will be the Okarkov regime's uh, period and the Soviet origins of the Russian views on deterrence. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, we, we are drawing our best. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, by unlock the video, I meant you have to unlock my video. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, well, uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And it's great to be here uh, today for what is your evening session and I suspect the one of the last sessions of the conference. Um, I am going to talk uh, relatively briefly about the enduring influence of Marshal Nikolai Vasilevich Agarkov and the broader period of Soviet military thought in the late 1970s and earlier 1980s under kind of his intellectual and thought leadership. My emphasis here is to point out some of the origins and interesting turning points in concepts that we broadly group as non-nuclear deterrence and some of the origins of transformation in contemporary Russian general purpose forces. Briefly, so who was Agarkov? Uh, he was chairman of the State Technical Commission in 1974 and then chief of the Soviet general staff in 77 to 1984, and then subsequently commander of Soviet forces and Western theater of military operations. Agarkov was a technologist at heart. He argued that a revolution in military affairs was taking place. Uh, this is conceived of as a radical change in how you conduct combat operations and the character of war due to simultaneous changes taking place in doctrines, organizational structures, and military technology. He sought to reshape the Soviet armed forces with a new generation of automated command and control systems and information-driven way of fighting which would emphasize non-nuclear means in combat operations and in deterrence as well. Um, I won't spend any time on the ideas of what RMA is. You can read plenty about that in Dima Adamski's book, and I suspect you might even be watching. So I'm not going to delve into those topics, not to give them any pain. Uh, but I do suggest reading Adamski's work on those subjects. So I do not attribute uh, all things to Agarkov specifically but in part to the period under his uh, intellectual leadership, though most of what I will comment on were Ogarkov's ideas. Uh, as analysts on Russia, I think we all look to historical influences, shine a line, a light on these specific individuals like Snesarev or Isserson, Tukashevsky, Svechin. But to me, uh, Nikolai Vasilievich is the elephant in the room. Nobody who has led Russian military strategy, doctrine or military reform debates served with Svechin or Tukashevsky or Isserson. These people did not live through the Cold War. They didn't have any sight picture on nuclear weapons or the contemporary military technology of today. Many debates leveraged their quotes in the way we uh, often quote Clausewitz here. But Slivchenko's sixth generation warfare, a lot of Gardeev's writing on military reorganization or strategic deterrence, Kokoshin's ideas on pre-nuclear deterrence, Bayevsky's views of reform, 
to me, are all building on an intellectual heritage that stems from the Garkov period. To me, they are all in different ways his intellectual children and intellectual children of that time. Um, so Garkov's principal influence to me is on the evolution and part of the general purpose force and the development of a strategic conventional deterrent. Um, and spawning a debate on the likelihood that escalation could be managed following limited nuclear use, a debate that really took off in the 80s and to some extent continues to today. So first, with respect to general purpose forces, although it's not the emphasis of, of the conversation I want to have today, his vision emphasized permanent high readiness combat groupings, operational level combat groupings, which would be joint in nature able to conduct offensive and defensive operations in each strategic direction. He believed that high readiness formations would be an essential factor in inducing restraint and would have a deterring effect on the adversary. Second, he erased the difference really between offensive and defensive strategic operation and instead integrated them in what are operations that are both offensive, defensive in nature, and in some ways the strategic operations you know today, the four standing ones on the books, to me, are successors to the strategic operations of that time. It was his initiative to integrate tactical aviation and air defense, seeing air power as decisive in the initial period of war and ground forces fundamentally as being secondary. Uh, that idea didn't fly back then, but as you know, the aerospace forces were ultimately created not that long ago, integrating aviation, air, air defense, missile defense, and the like. And like pretty, they look pretty much like what Ogarkov was proposing back then. So this is a tremendously remarkable coincidence. Um, you know, Kim Akramev and Varenikov worked hard to restore uh, operational strategic training at the general staff, flattening the command structure, and also strongly emphasized jointness across the force and testing concepts and ideas to uh, strategic command staff exercises. He led development of operational maneuver groups reconnaissance strike and reconnaissance fire complex complexes, which I know have been mentioned uh, at the seminar several times already beforehand. And he had a major influence on the development of command and control systems. And this is also well known. Um, by this, I don't mean that he personally built them in his garage, but that he strongly supported oversaw testing and adoption of a subsequent generation of these systems. Um, and probably one of the big fundamental influence he had was on the development of the next generation of long range precision guy weapons. Many systems we're familiar with today were either launched during his time or the R&D and development of them were, were launched during his time. But let me focus on non-nuclear and sort of nuclear deterrence concept. So under Agarkov, the Soviet general staff began to crystallize the idea that precision guy conventional weapons could be assigned the task to ranges and target sets previously dedicated to theater nuclear weapons they would be accurate, they would be effective, and they could even range the homelands of the principal opponents, the United States and the Soviet Union. This conferred strategic effects onto conventional capabilities and anticipated the war fought with conventional weapons alone could be fairly devastating, implying substantial countervalue attacks against critically important objects in the homelands themselves. That tells us the threat of strategic conventional attack, what Russian military today calls, calls a mass electronic fire operation uh, with long range precision guided weapons, electronic warfare and the like, really begins more during his time period and it never stops. Because he was not just talking about a conventional exchange of war in Europe, but also fundamentally between the US and USSR and increasingly what we like to call global domains, the emphasis in his time was space. So he identified the problem the Russian military establishment really begins to grapple or continues to grapple with for the next 40 years. He conceptualized that the front and the rear would disappear and that it would not be possible to limit or isolate the battlefield, that critical objects and infrastructure could be hit from the outside of war, and that this is why the initial period of war was so decisive. And to me is the progenitor of Russian fears that unacceptable levels of damage or a substantial level of paralysis could be in inflicted by a NATO airspace conventional attack in this initial period. He posited the central challenge as the independent conventional war option in the nuclear scared environment, because the US would not necessarily need tactical nuclear weapons in order to win. Uh, this was not new. Soviet military writing began to make it clear that nuclear war was not inevitable in the 1960s, particularly if we look back to 1968. They prepared for both conventional and nuclear war, 
But under Agarkov, a protracted conventional war became more the centerpiece of planning. And the focus on the conventional phase that might last considerably longer than, than previous uh, doctrinal considerations, or that that would be the entirety of the war. The whole war could be fought as a conventional conflict. Uh, and that meant that the USSR both needed to be able to fight and win such a war, but also to deter it with conventional means. Now, Brezhnev's speech at Tula in 1977, which many of you are familiar with, fundamentally left the Garkov and Soviet military very few options. But that postulated that political victory was not possible in the nuclear war, and that nuclear weapons were not viable as instruments of politics and practice, only in theory, and that nuclear war could not be won and therefore should not be fought. Now, Garkov obviously can't be credited with Brezhnev's speech. What he can be credited with is aligning military strategy and thinking with strategy at the political level, which does not always happen. In fact, we see plenty of times when it does not. Well, Garkov generally seemed to believe that nuclear war would actually be short, although this is some debate because he writes one thing one time and another thing a bit down the line. But he was clearly walking away from the idea that the protracted nuclear war or uh, Soviet sort of strategy based on prolonged survival under nuclear attack should be a central premise. And this is in the late 1970s, and it tracks well incidentally with his long-standing hatred of spending on civil defense at the time. One of his major fights was to stop spending money on civil defense, which he believed was literally burying money into the ground because they were storing tremendous numbers of equipment and weapons for the sort of like sustained civil defense uh, force and uh, to focus on building a force around the next generation of conventional weapons. He didn't think civil defense was going to be especially that useful for deterrence. Garka rejected limited nuclear war in the European theater and military operations. This is important. He stuck to Brezhnev's formulation of Tula, believing that nuclear war will have, well, it won't be controlled, but more importantly, that it will have a global character. And this is interesting. Hence, the idea of regional versus global levels of nuclear deterrence is something that emerged considerably post Ogarkov's time, um, as with kind of the emphasis on non-strategic nuclear weapons, which we see much more during the latter 1990s and 2000s. This is quite useful for us, I think, to examine, because we can then see or establish the Russian ideas on escalation management via non-strategic nuclear weapons, or regional nuclear deterrent concepts are not prevalent during this time period. In fact, in many respects, they are rejected. So we know that they we can roughly periodize when they emerge and track their evolution. Well, Garkov argued that a disarming nuclear strike was possible. Sorry, a disarming nuclear strike was impossible, uh, important difference. Um, and that further nuclear arms race was completely pointless. It was impossible to avoid unacceptable levels of damage from his point of view. And in part, that was because what constituted unacceptable levels of damage was a requirement that was steadily being reduced over time. What's interesting is that we see a strong belief in the stability of nuclear deterrence and its durability while conventional war unfolds. To me, this is the origin of more discrete levels of deterrence that we sub see subsequently emerged in the Russian military doctrine. In his time period, we're fundamentally probably looking at only two, conventional and global nuclear, right? So what's missing from this picture? There's no local conflict and not really a conversation on deterrence at the level of local war. And there's also no real regional war deterrence versus large scale war, which is a distinction that emerges much later down the line in Russian military doctrine. What we come to see later on in, the doc in Russian military doctrine is emphasis on different roles of nuclear weapons in global and regional levels of deterrence. And then, of course, a strong return to building out what was Ogarkov's dream, right? An emphasis on non nuclear deterrence and conventional means. Now, it was also under his tenure the tactical nuclear weapons, in my point of view, began shifting into the role of escalation management we currently find them in. Not via limited nuclear use, not via the belief that they could be used in what Russian military calls deterrence via uh, limited use of force, that is in, in singular group strikes, but in limiting the escalation from conventional war to nuclear. In general, you can see during this time period that theater nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons steadily begin to lose utility as war fighting instruments. They kind of end up sandwiched in between a strong emphasis on conventional warfare the increasingly strategic nature of uh, offensive conventional capabilities, 
and on nuclear deterrence at this more global level and the belief that any use of nuclear weapons will likely lead to uncontrolled escalation and to large scale strategic nuclear exchange. Um, so we can also uh, thank Ogarkov for the endless mantra uh, that we come across in Russian military writing about weapons based on new physical principles. Um, and this is basically a category of both current capabilities and uh, imagined future capabilities that Russian military believes will have strategic effects or actually inflict potentially the sort of uh, levels of damage and strategic consequences that nuclear weapons could. And so now we're forced to kind of deal with this concept ever since Ogarkov's period uh, throughout Russian military writing and increasingly, but increasingly a more practical conversation, that, okay, electronic warfare, offensive cyber, directed energy capabilities and the like, the um, hypersonics, that these are partially real capabilities and they can have strategic effects. And so they form a system of non-nuclear deterrence, right? That they're slotted in there and lots of Russian military writers talk about more practically how they fit into this picture. Um, whereas in Agarkov's view, I think a lot of this was more, Agarkov's period, this was more future gazing. So to me, Agarkov's ideas are probably uh, if not the most significant driver of contemporary Russian military reforms, and certainly one of the most significant drivers, along with increasing emphasis on non-nuclear deterrence and the proposition that conventional weapons are strategic, can have strategic effects, and that they can form an important basis for the strategic deterrence forces alongside nuclear weapons. Uh, also, I think there's pretty good evidence that levels of deterrence, kind of this dichotomy or uh, what increasingly a Russian military thought now is probably more of a triad, comes uh, begins to emerge during this time period, um, along with thinking on stability at the conventional versus uh, global nuclear level of deterrence. So uh, in conclusion, I am not an expert on the Garkov, nor am I his biographer, and I don't know everything about them. But I found this to be interesting, and I hope you all did too. So if you're still awake, I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, and is, I, I think we have a few minutes time for, for quick questions, is there any? Maybe, maybe if I if I may present a short short question, um, you you mentioned that the Ogarkov is maybe the most significant driver of one of those most significant drivers of Russian military thought con in contemporary setting, but has this been acknowledged in a in a way that uh, uh, that he's been referred to continuously or not referred to? Has is there some significant uh, criticism towards him, or um, how would you say how his uh, thinking is um, visible in in the in the Russian current discussions? Sure, thanks, uh, Katri. Yeah, I mean, I think that most of the people that drove uh, uh, the Russian military debates, particularly in the 90s uh, after Agarkov, they really took off with his ideas, and they generally credit him. Some really lionize him, like Gadiev. Uh, others built a much better framework around some of his ideas, like Slipchenko with Sixth Generation War. But you see the thrust of what Slipchenko is talking about are discussions being had in the early 1980s by Soviet general staff. Uh, Kokoshin as well, and certainly people we've come to know, like Balyuevsky, who were huge fans of his. Uh, Ogarkov is not quoted or cited necessarily that commonly, by senior Russian military officials. Because if they're going to cite someone, they'll throw in a sedation quote in there or something like that, right? Just like our people will probably throw in a, a quote to Clausewitz and they're not gonna, you know, uh, necessarily quote uh, a contemporary general, sure. Um, and in some ways, Agarkov had a more interesting conversation about the how and not necessarily that influential in shaping the debate between kind of the three main strategies that you, you will often see discussed, you know, strategy of annihilation, strategy of attrition, or strategy of exhaustion. This is kind of, if you can intellectually pause it, uh, Tukashevsky versus Svechin debate, right? And he doesn't play as big of a role in this discussion, 
But in, in terms of uh, military strategy, when we look at force structure, force posture, capability investments, concepts of operations, what matters for war fighting, what matters for the terms, I think Agarka probably has uh, the strongest influence. And that's pretty logical because these people served with him. And his ideas came from a practical time of 1980s, which directly drove the evolution of character of war and concepts of operations in the 90s and 2000s. Nobody served with Svetlana and Tukhachevsky, and they were writing an interwar period, which is, has, you know, I mean, there, there are obviously some technical dissimilarities. Uh, strategy is, you know, you can always look back for lessons on strategy, but, but nonetheless, I, I do think that uh, he is by far a more significant influence. Okay, and that subject is debatable. And most importantly, if you want to debate it, I'm not advancing a Garkov in sort of competition for those of you who, who are deeply excited about Svechin or Snesarev or anyone else, right? We all have pictures of the puzzle. I'm simply suggesting that he's a more contemporary, more recent influence, and perhaps a more practical one, right? So it's not a competition for who influenced contemporary Russian military thought the most. Um, and I'm sure Russian military, as you know, is pretty well read. But in terms of ideas, I thought that a lot of what Agarkov proposed during his time was in fact implemented. And if you don't agree with my thesis, then you must believe that this is a tremendous coincidence. Okay, oh. thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now we have two questions. From Ray Finch. I, I think, Ray, if you could tell the question directly, you are now promoted as a, as a panelist. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, Michael, great presentation. I just was curious, how much, if any, did the communist ideology inform the writings of Ogarkov? Did he uh, you know, put the whatever imprimatur in there in his writings at this house, that his writings somehow conformed to the communist ideology? Thank you. Hey, happy to take that on. Um, what really influenced him was uh, not, not so much communist ideology, but the tradition, the dialectical tradition under communism, which is principally Hegelian, right? Which is that uh, there's a progress, um, first there's a progress in, in terms of uh, technology and theory, that as new theories come to compete with existing theories, they are uh, counterposed against existing theory that there are sort of, this is like kind of the angles uh, posit that what you see is a consistent interaction between quantitative and qualitative, one transitioning to the other, another one transitioning back to it. Uh, the second one is the concept of negation, right? Which is that you have counters that negate existing technologies and existing sort of uh, uh, organizational concepts. And one thing that influenced Agarkov really in the late seventies was the belief that nuclear weapons had negated themselves right, that even though there was no technology that could effectively negate nuclear weapons, that is a counter to nuclear weapons, a defense against nuclear weapons, that nuclear weapons have fundamentally negated themselves because they made war politically unwinnable, right? And this is what drove a big part of the conversation on the emphasis for the independent conventional war option. So in this regard, yes, I, I don't believe uh, that the communist ideology per se was a strong influence, but the tradition of dialectic that communism existed from Hegelian philosophy definitely did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and then there is another question from Edward Grace. Could you please tell the question directly you are promoted to as a panelist? And, uh, Thank you. So, I wanted to ask about the question of, basically it's like I concur that Ogarkov was this thinker who was definitely ahead of his time. The, the issue is that he was ahead of his time. And so he was ahead both, I think, of technology, which at least in the Russian case is like, it's only been in the last 15 years or less that they've really been able to field the technologies that made some of his operational concepts practical possibilities. But also that he was just ahead of his political and institutional context, too, is that my impression is that uh, the Defense Secretary Ustinov and the military services, uh, and to a certain degree, the military industrial complex, which was threatened by the notion of like, well, we're going to constrain spending on these things that we're currently building, and we're going to build these new things. Of course, there are people who are interested in building the new things, but there is also a, a sense of very threatened about 
moving away from the things that were invested in. So my sense is that there was actually a whole lot of active hostility to the uh, Ugarikov's ideas in the late 70s and early 80s. And so I, I was just wondering what you would, uh, what your sense of that was. Sure, I'll take that. Yeah, there was. Uh, there's no more precarious place to be in uh, an institution or bureaucracy than being ahead of your time um, for, for a whole number of reasons. So uh, he had quite a number of fights. Uh, some people legitimately question his thesis on automation of war in general and a sort of do sex mock in a notion that um, we'd have that they would have automated systems of command and control and recon strike recon fire complexes and that these things were sort of uh, uh, be to such an extent um, automated and uh, other people sort of questioned the military strategy approach of trying to compete with the United States in qualitative conventional capabilities and the utility and efficacy of that arms race giving the economic constraints of the Soviet Union at the time as well. So some people argued that he was playing into your strategy essentially and engaging on top, having checkmated basically U.S. nuclear advantages at tactical, operational, sort of strategic level, that he was sort of pushing the Soviet Union towards a conventional competition now, which could be economically erroneous. Um, and some of those were fair criticism. Although on the money question, uh, yes, of course, he wanted more money for those reforms, and he had strong opposition to that. But then the Soviet Union ended up spending, increasing the military budget anyway <laughs> under Gorbachev uh, by several percent. Um, the local institutional context. So yeah, of course, you have to fight people who want legacy things. He had a big fight with people who wanted to feed civil defense. He had fight with people who wanted to procure lots of legacy force and infrastructure. One of his arguments, for example, was with Gorshkov, because Agarkov basically was yelling at Gorshkov for the fact that the Soviet Navy liked building ships and didn't like to buy the infrastructure to actually maintain them. And he was also pretty annoyed at Gorshkov's ideas that the Soviet Union should spend money on uh, on carriers, right? But this like this is one kind of I think accurate example of of the different fights he had with other people. Um, but he got a lot done. He actually I think I think it's fair to say that the things he didn't get done, for example, his, his idea of integrating uh, uh, the air force and air defense didn't pan out. But nonetheless, Russia ended up going in this direction down the line. He did get quite a bit done in terms of what he was able to introduce in both Soviet military thought. But when we talk about automated systems, command and control, um, testing things in strategic command staff exercises, developing and deploying these sort of recon strike, recon fire complexes, which was the idea back then that Russia actually finishes off in the last 15 years. I think, I think there's a tremendous amount there. So it is more that the people that follow him are able, I think, to accomplish many of his ideas versus how much he was able to get done himself. And ultimately, he was relieved and, you know, uh, pushed into being uh, commander of Western uh, TVD. But, uh, but a lot of that is also because of the numerous political fights he picked. And we could spend here a long time talking about, like, the various fascinating aspects of Ogarkov's, uh, Ogarkov's tenure. But, yeah, no, he had plenty of pushback, and, and uh, he had to deal with uh, in, intransigent interests and the defense sector and, and all that. Thank you. And then we have uh, at least uh, two questions more, but I, I think we spare them to the to the panel discussion. So, so I think we might now now introduce our next speaker, and he is Clint Reach. He's a policy analyst at Rand Corporation. He holds a master's degree in political science from Kansas State University and master's degree in Russian and Eurasian studies from John Hopkins. His research focuses on, on security and Russian military issues. Previously, he has served for nine years as a Russian linguist in the US Navy and in various positions at the Department of Defense. And his title this evening in this seminar is Russian views on correlation of forces and means and nuclear deterrence. Clint, please, the floor is yours. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, uh, thanks for having me. I'm gonna try and um, 
share my screen here so that you can take a look at my slides. Um, let's see. Is that coming through okay, or do I need to? Not yet, not yet. Okay. How about, how about that? Yes, we can see it now. Yes, perfectly. All right. All right, thanks. Sorry for that little uh, snafu there, but I think we're, I think we're up and running. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, correlation of forces and means and some possible intersections with nuclear and non-nuclear deterrence, uh, particularly focused on the latter of the two. Um, I think the Mike's presentation was the perfect segue. Um, I think you'll see a lot of, of similar themes here, so we can kind of trace the line from the 70s to today. Um, so but we'll see where it goes. Um, so we did a report, we published a report on correlation of forces, Russian um, approaches and applications of correlations of forces of means, um, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, and in that report, we talked about uh, modern future war and the influence that that was having on Russian views of correlation of forces. So I'll briefly go over some of that history and a little bit about our findings. And then I'll move in to talk about... Please, yes. excuse me, we saw a beautiful picture of, of mountains and, and, and windy and, and forests, but not the correlation oh. forces. Oh, you're not seeing my, my slides? Not the slide, I, I think. Yeah, this is a beautiful screen. picture. But well, the, I think you're projecting the wrong screen. How many monitors you got? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I got, I got two <clears throat> monitors. I think you're projecting the other monitor. Right. It, it was there for a second, so you had it, the slides were visible and then it switched. There we go. Oh, now no, you have the no. slides. Yes. There we go. We're on it. All right. Thanks. Sorry about that. So anyway, um, talking about, I'll, get, I'll take you through the, the report and some of the findings and then um, we'll talk about where the intersection is between those findings and non-nuclear deterrence. How are we doing on slides? Are we still good? Yes. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, yes. yeah you're good, you're good. All right, so correlation of forces. Um, correlation of forces has sort of, I think it obtained this sort of mythical status during the Cold War, um, it was kind of, I mean, not really living through much of it myself, but reading through the history, it seems like um, it was the focus of a lot of attention, attention in the West. What did the Russians mean? What did the Soviets mean when they were set, talking about correlation of forces? Um, what did it include? What were the implications? Um, and my, my explanation is that I think Soviet politicians largely co-opted a military term and elevated it to the status of, of sort of, you know, something all encompassing. Um, but they were using it as, as a way, perhaps crudely, but they were using it as a way to measure state competition on a broad level. Um, and it was useful to them because there was this competition between the two ideological camps. Um, and, and so you could look at economics, you could look at alliances, you could look at diplomacy, military, um, et cetera, and try to come up with a way to determine who was winning um, and, and where the balance of, balance of power was shifting and in the direction of which camp. Um, but today, 
Russian leadership hardly ever uses the term correlation of forces. Uh, and when they do, they seem to be mostly talking about what you might expect, um, sort of force balances in a particular region and, and so on. Um, so that created a bit of problems earlier on in our research because uh, I think we had initially thought we might see a bunch of discussions uh, in Russia today about um, this broad measures of, of state power and, and you know where Russia sort of fit in the hierarchy of states these days. Um, but that really wasn't what we found at all. What we found in, in the literature was a bunch of discussion about this concept called combat potential. Um, and when you go back and look at the Soviet military writing on correlation of forces, you will also find a lot of discussion about combat potential. Um, so what is combat potential? Combat potential is a concept that probably in the context of COFM anyway, um, that probably originated in the late 1950s. And it was a way to incorporate quality into your assessment of correlation of forces. So if before it was really about bean counting aircraft, tanks, artillery, divisions. Um, then, then after combat potential, the, the, the idea was, the so from the Soviet general staff was, we wanna incorporate this combat potential concept so that we can get a clearer picture of what is going on in terms of correlation of military forces. Um, because they felt like weapons were becoming more sophisticated and it was more important how things work together jointly and if you were just counting things, then you really weren't going to get a clear picture of what was going on. Uh, Danilovich said in his interview with Heinz that if you just take quantity into effect, you're really only getting half the picture in his view. Um, so that's, that's kind of what this was about. So in order to incorporate quality, uh, the Soviets commissioned two officer mathematicians named Vitaly Tsigichka and Yuri Fedulov and together they designed what's called the model of strategic operations. And the model of strategic operations was intended to do a lot of things um, mo from measuring the effects of nuclear weapons to studying the capabilities of the Chinese transportation system to mobilize forces and move them to the Soviet border uh, and so on. Um, one of the important parts for our the purpose of our discussion, one of the important parts of the model of strategic operations is that it was based on systems analysis. Vitaly Tsigichka still works at the Institute of Systems Analysis today. Um, and it was it looked at the strategic operation as a complex hierarchical system that was composed of subsystems, each of which had their own sort of qualitative properties um, that were really important. To the function whose functioning was really important to the performance of the overall strategic operation. So that's kind of how they they broke it down uh, in order to analyze it. And I think um, that's going to be an important important point as we go forward. Um, but over time, um, the Soviets thought that the model was too expensive. It required too much expertise to sustain and so on. And so they wanted a cheaper way to do it. And what they came up with was um, was, was it started in Project Lava, but the, the work actually started before that. But um, Project Lava from 1995 to 2001 was headed up by a former submarine officer named Lev Zaharov, um, who teamed up with folks you probably know, Sergei Bogdanov, Sergei Chekhanov. Um, and they did some work on this, on this combat potential question and ultimately came up uh, with a method that's as far as I can tell, still in use today, or at least some, some version of it. Um, so that's, that's just a little bit of the history. I think it's kind of interesting and biased, but um, in any case, the important takeaways are, are that they did sort of bring with them some of the same systems analysis ideas um, that, that came from the model of strategic operations. And, and they don't, and they, the important thing to highlight is that, you know, formation isn't just the um, just the individual pieces that make, make it up. It's the synergies between them um, that are important. Um, so correlation of forces, that, that's sort of the methodology. That's the thinking behind it. Um, but in practical terms, uh, this I want to highlight the evolution that's gone on because of the changes in modern warfare. 
that we already touched on in, in Mike's presentation. Um, it was this idea from the first Gulf War, the idea that it wasn't just about uh, your ground forces, force formations, it wasn't about just your number of tanks, it, it was about new weapons technology, uh, new weapons systems, long range precision munitions in particular, uh, but also the technology behind them. Um, and when you bring the high tech uh, to the to the military application, um, this the information technology to the military application, this is what you get. Um, the first Gulf War, Yugoslavia, Iraq 2003, Libya uh, 2011. Um, and this had a had a I think a large effect on uh, Russian force structure, uh, force planning, operational planning, strategic operations, and everything else. Um, I don't think you can you can overstate its importance. Um, but this way of war that exhibited that was exhibited by the U.S. and its allies in the first Gulf War is still a, an important, if not the most important, primary driver of Russian thinking on deterrence. Um, so Russia took the U.S. way of war, and uh, some analysts have applied it to the European theater, and um, and this is sort of what it looks like, uh, as far as I can tell, based on this and a, and a few other sources, and then Russian writing, and it's it's the buildup of the strategic aerospace operation um, based on you know interconnectivity with satellites and other C4ISR our infrastructure um, to carry out precision strike at depth uh, against uh, Russian military and non-military targets across the European part of Russia, from the Kola Peninsula down to Crimea and the North Caucasus, potentially. Um, so this is, this is sort of where they are in their thinking. Um, but the question is, what does Russia plan to do about it? Um, and I think this is really the, if we want to bring a Garkov back into the, the picture, um, you know, what we're seeing here is sort of, I think, what at least the vague idea that uh, a Garkov had in terms of the confluence of information technology and future war. Uh, and then what comes next is, is the Russian thinking about what they need to do about it. In the early 2000s, um, there was a lively debate on the type of armed force that Russia needed to both manage the NATO threat and to deal with the more likely local conflicts along their periphery. And I think there were two interesting and related themes that came out of this time period that are relevant for our discussion. Um, the first is that in future war, the soldier, the tank, the force grouping may not necessarily be the priority target um, for Russian actions, for Russian strikes, kinetic, non-kinetic, and so forth. It would be the enabling infrastructure required to make the system of the strategic aerospace system work. Um, Slipchenko talked about this in the early 2000s, um, but what I think is, what I've found interesting is that if even the sort of rank and file uh, missile and artillery troop officers, for example, were writing about this uh, around 2008, 2009. And they were saying also that it's the critically important targets um, that stand sort of behind or underneath um, this operation that are, are really worth paying attention to and worth focusing on from a target targeting perspective. Uh, and the other idea was non-nuclear deterrence, um, which we talked about in the first brief. Non-nuclear deterrence is basically uh, a light version of strategic deterrence. Forces and means intended to inflict certain specified levels of damage uh, that would have both consequential have consequential consequential effects both um, from a war fighting perspective and from a psychological perspective on the leadership and the populations of the adversary. So around 2008, the Russian general staff, ba based, on these, based on this thinking, um, around 2008, the general staff adopted what's known as a strategic operation to destroy critically important targets, or SADSIT. 
And so most often Russians describe stop sit, sod sit as destruction of critically important targets uh, that could result in man-made man disasters or in the destruction or degradation of the military economic potential of the opponent. Um, what's sort of interesting about that to me is that uh, the strategic operation of nuclear forces is presumably also supposed to destroy the military economic potential of the adversary. Um, so what's, what's the difference? How, how is Sadsit different from another, from another strategic operation? Uh, and I think there's still some work to be done on this question, um, but I think the, the primary answer is that we're talking about conventional munitions on the one hand versus strategic nuclear weapons on the other. Uh, the big question mark is about the non-strategic nuclear weapons and their role in destroying critically important targets. Um, but in any case, uh, in 2011, two to three years after the general staff had uh, introduced this new strategic operational concept, um, Berenik and Pachatnov, senior researchers at 46th uh, Scientific Research Institute, published a book uh, called Strategic Deterrence that was specifically devoted to this question of non-nuclear deterrence and the use of conventional precision munitions. Um, you know, what made the most sense in term, from a targeting perspective uh, in terms of employing conventional precision, precision munitions? Um, and what they, I'll get into what they came up with later, but my, my point is this, that there was some churn in the Russian military science community after the strategic operation um, was unveiled to figure out how to actually make it work from a practical perspective. Um, and Berenik and Pachatinov uh, discussed the use of non-nuclear deterrence force groupings that were specifically intended uh, to strike targets uh, that would have this sort of psychological or cascading effect, um, depending on the target and the intention. Um, but fast forward to 2018, and if you look at the quote on the right side of the slide, Gerasimov announced and he may have discussed this earlier, but this is the first I had seen it, that groupings of long range cruise missile platforms have been created for deterrence in each strategic direction. Um, so I'm at least theorizing that those types of discussions that were being had back in 2010, 11, and so forth, um, have, had, have had an influence in the way Russians are thinking about their force structure, force disposition, and, and the role of these forces in, in operations. Um, and I think it's important to point out that if you look at all of these quotes on the right side and what's going on in the actual slide, you see that Russians are not only thinking about attacking um, sort of the tip of the spear, the submarine platforms that are capable of launching uh, submarine launch cruise missiles, um, but they're after going after the enablers. Um, that make that whole make the whole system work, um, and if you look at the final um, action down in the sequence of retaliatory actions that are listed here, you see destruction of critically important infrastructure targets with outcomes long range aviation and, and so on. So I'm tracing what I'm doing is just tracing what the Russians are talking about, and and, and pointing out the theories. Uh, and, and the underlying thinking behind it all, and then looking at, at how it's actually being, how that's actually translating into what they're doing in practice. So, but that's the theory. Um, I think the Russian theory is fairly clear um, in terms of what they're trying to do. It's really all about the execution. And this comes back to what Berenuk and Pachatinov were writing about in 2011. It's that we know, we the Russians know what we would do if we had these weapons, if we had a lot of them, um, but what if we don't have a lot of them? Um, what do we do then? What do we target with precision guided munitions uh, that are expensive uh, and that may be somewhat limited in number? And what they concluded back in 2011, before things had, had really um, kicked off in terms of pursuit of these goals, um, they found that really the best thing, best way to use these types of weapons would be go after what they called counter value targets, um, 
which were non-military targets um, that would either have some consequential effect on NATO's ability to carry out, carry out its way of war, um, or that could have some sort of psychological effect on the population, um, but without the extreme escalation of strategic nuclear weapon strikes. And they also said that uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons were, were more suitable for counterforce operations um, targeting, they, we, they didn't go actually go into specifics, but uh, I've put a couple down uh, for consideration. So what does all of this mean for correlation of forces and deterrence? And I think I've come up, when I take a, when I take a look at what the Russians are saying and doing, uh, these are sort of the trajectories that I see potentially. Um, now, strategic nuclear weapons, based on everything that you hear from Putin, Shoigu, Russian military science, Russian military analysts, um, they all tend to agree that over the next few decades, um, strategic nuclear weapons are going to continue to be the ultimate guarantor of Russian national security. Um, so just because we see the the downward trend, I don't want to confuse the matter. Um, but um, there are also indications that Russians are looking to get away from nuclear weapons, from a reliance on nuclear weapons, and, it, and they want to transition much more to a conventional non-nuclear deterrence um, armed force. The quote from Grasimov in 2017 um, speaks to that. Um, but again, the problem is how do the, do the Russians have the means uh, to carry out this sort of non-nuclear deterrence strategy, the strategic operation to destroy critically important targets? Um, I think we'll see. Uh, just for one frame of reference, um, in the 2011 Libya campaign, um, the United States and allies expended over 7,000 PGMs in 13 days. So that gives you a sense of how resource intensive this sort of non-contact, non-nuclear deterrence strategy is. Um, and so an open question for me is, you know, how far are the Russians willing to go with this? Um, I do think it's interesting that some of the research, some of the literature I've been looking at lately really has been looking to the 2030s as a time when Russia may have sufficient capability to turn the theory into full-blown reality. Um, based on what I've seen from the numbers uh, in terms of what Russia has in munitions, maybe that's, maybe that's realistic. Um, but in the meanwhile, they also have other capabilities that could augment um, this, this plan to threaten or attack uh, the critical infrastructure that's required for the aerospace attack in addition to the platforms and munitions themselves. Uh, of course, cyber weapons, electronic warfare, um, and anti-space systems are all seem to be all at the top of the list. And so I don't see any sort of change in where the Russians are going in any of those areas. Uh, it will just be a matter of, of being able to build technology that's, that's actually effective and affordable. Um, but these, these could all be augmenting tools uh, for sort of a, uh, an ability to attack critical infrastructure. Cyber is the most interesting one to me because I'm interested in how it might fit into a sod sit type strategic operation. What's the role of cyber in something like that? Um, I think over time it could potentially be large, um, but I, I'm not a cyber expert, so I don't want to speak too much to that. But it's just from everything we've been seeing, Russia has shown that it's at least able to get access into places that we would prefer them not to have access to. Um, and I don't think that they're just gaining access to figure out what people are sending in emails. Um, 
I personally see cyber intrusions as having dual purpose, one of which is general espionage, um, learning what we're talking about, where we're going, that kind of thing, but also thinking about ways to get into critical infrastructure and disable it or destroy it or whatever the capabilities of future cyber weapons might be. Um, to summarize, I would say that Russian non-nuclear deterrence is centered on achieving maximum physical and psychological effects to achieve the following ends, to deter the conflict, terminate the conflict, or impose Russia's way of war. Um, one thing I forgot to mention in the main portion of the brief was that turning a non-contact war into a contact war is something that the Russians have been talking about um, since at least the early 2000s. Um, and I think if they're not able to deter the war or terminate the war, um, the next best thing would be to do enough damage in the initial period um, that NATO has to fight in a way that it doesn't prefer and that is more suited to Russian sort of traditional strengths. Um, tanks and artillery uh, and that kind of contact warfare as opposed to the non-contact warfare that NATO would prefer to fight. Um, so those are sort of the, the three, I think, objectives of where Russia wants to go. Uh, the theory, again, as I said, I think is fairly clear and fairly straightforward. It's simply about the execution over time. Um, will Russia be able to maintain uh, its ability to develop these systems uh, in this qu insufficient quantities needed to, to do the mission? Um, the key for NATO, I think, is to, is in this, at least on this front, is to take countermeasures to make it more difficult for Russia to implement what they're trying to do. Um, it's a res they, they are having to develop their own non-contact capability. Um, so make it more, more resource intensive for them um, by protecting your bases, protecting your logistic sites, by using concealment and so forth. A lot of ideas have been tossed out that are out there already. Um, I think it's just a matter of NATO getting organized and getting ready and getting going uh, on, you know, taking countermeasures to deal with a problem that they had, that they neglected for a while. Um, so on that, I'll conclude and open it up to questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Clint, and, and I think uh, Michael have a comment. Could you please yeah, uh, sure. Uh, great, great talk as always by uh, my uh, brother Rand. Um, so my open question was sort of, all right, to what extent will Russia substitute non-nuclear deterrence sort of our uh, conception of strategic conventional capabilities for nuclear in, in the different types of war conceptualized given there's a very strong belief in the Russian military that nuclear weapons fundamentally offer a different psychological effect than conventional weapons and that they cannot be substituted for just by conventional capability in full even in regional war scenarios plus they are pretty important as a coercive contributor to ideas about limited use of conventional capabilities against critical objects and the like that is there's sort of this belief that okay limited conventional employment will have much more added course of effect if there's a perception that you're going through an escalation ladder deployment. And so kind of the, you know, the, the, the big, the big uh, uh, thesis that, that I'm trying to advance here is that um, to what extent is it really a question of how much conventional capability you have, or can we clearly see, so obviously where I'm leaning, um, some theoretical left and right boundaries on how Russia is never going to become the United States. And even if you came tomorrow with a giant truck loaded with long range conventional weapons, as many as Russians would like to have, they will never substitute completely theater nuclear weapons or their role. But this is not the answer because there are theoretical boundaries of how they see this thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. I think that's for, for one thing. I mean, I think when you 
when you look at it, this is why it's, it's like 2050 when they're talking about um, the role of nuclear weapons sort of being, um, I don't know, subverted by some new some new technology. I mean, I think I I don't want to um, maybe oversell this idea. I guess it's, it's it's that it's not that the Russians are going to get rid of all of their nuclear weapons. I mean, I think they've said repeatedly that they see their non strategic nuclear weapons as a sort of counter to their deficiency in PGM. So um, it's not going to happen anytime soon. I guess my question would be, um, how do they achieve their mission? Um, what, one of their missions, I think, which I think is to impose the Russian way of war on NATO, um, if it ever came to that, um, if they have such a strong reliance on non-strategic nuclear weapons, um, if they're not able to get the truckload of PGMs, um, this is the open question in, in my mind is, it's non-strategic non nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons are have a lot of utility from a deterrent standpoint, but they're highly problematic from a war fighting perspective, which is the point that Agarkov made. And so uh, it's just, it's just a question to me of, of how they would be able to do that um, if they didn't have a substantial conventional capability to, to get them there. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that is that they create a bit of a realistic nuclear scared environment that lacks some of the stability that you have with strategic nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear deterrence, right? Because it's kind of a strong belief coming back from Ogarkov's time period that, you know, or strategic nuclear deterrence and deterrence at the global at the global level, it, it has so much stability in it that it actually affords you a tremendous amount of conventional war. And that maybe it is that non-strategic nuclear weapons actually create some interesting left and right boundaries for US conventional force operations because they create a nuclear uh, scared environment, but that nuclear scared environment actually isn't all that stable, right? Because of both qualitative changes in theater nuclear weapons, but also the, the fact that um, you have uh, just differences in concepts of operations and forces and credibility and the like. So if that makes any sense, that that could be basically, it has a shaping effect, if that, if that makes sense. Not by using it, but it's um, has a deterring effect by being a force in being. The existence of said capabilities and perception of credible plans to use them has a shaping effect on NATO operations without them necessarily being used. Absolutely. I, mean, I think that that has to be the case when Russia has so many of them. And, and I think they, they're not, they, they do rely on ambiguity, of course, in their, in their nuclear policy and in their nuclear strategy. Um, but they certainly hint uh, at the fact that this is a part of their sort of war fighting strategy. Um, so we have to take it into account, um, you know. So I, I, yeah, I think we're, in, I think we agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and then I ask, ask Christine Van Ruskar to raise the question, which is already there. Could you please say it loud? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you very much, both Mike and Clint, for your excellent presentations, as always. Uh, uh, Mike, you got you got back to me in the in the chat with regard to the regional uh, level of war and whether or not nuclear weapons had a role to play. Um, I I just had to go back and look at this definition then from the Voroshilov lectures because I was I was curious and I mean the definitions that you find in the Soviet period as well of regional wars are very are leaning heavily on the role of nuclear weapons then as well so that was why that uh, comment that you had on how uh, the regional level of war was not really uh, playing a similar role as uh, um, as what we've seen in the, in the Russian period really sort of spurred my my interest I think my impression would be that. Uh, that um, that the role of nuclear weapons has certainly played on the region uh, has certainly changed in the post Cold War period on the regional uh, level of war, but that the definitions of the types of war seem to be to be quite 
similar, uh, as well as the role that nuclear weapons may play in them, but the role that nuclear weapons play in Russian strategy may have changed uh, on that level. Um, but but maybe I maybe we are in disagreement, or maybe it's just that I didn't clearly quite clearly understand what you said. Uh, I also had a question for you, uh, Clint. I was just wondering. If you could say a little bit more about uh, Russian deliberations of the this uh, logic behind this delineation that you describe in your slide as well um, between uh, uh, the counter value versus the counter force targeting of non-nuclear and nuclear assets and what they say about uh, about the logic behind that de that sort of clear uh, delineation. I mean, I, I could be, just because I could imagine that you could argue sort of both ways. So I was wondering if there is like an, a discussion about that or whether it's just sort of stated as a fact that this this type of delineation will have a less escalatory effect. Thanks. So the first thing I should say is that 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 slide is taken from uh, Berenuk and Pachadnov's book. Um, it's not meant to represent, um, you know, the consensus within within Russia on the issue um, and in their book they they don't they don't say exact they don't they're not explicitly clear on why they came to that conclusion um they sort of they they just they imply the fact that if you that the going after sort of these counter force counter military targets um which again they're not super clear on on what those are but they imply that you know, the amount of munitions required to do sufficient damage to those targets is simply too large uh, to, to use conventional PGMs for when you don't have that many to begin with. Um, and so my, my takeaway from their discussion was that they just wanted, they were trying to figure out ways to get more bang for their buck uh, with limited munitions. And also, it's important to point out that that was in 2011. Um, so things have, have changed since then. Um, so that's, but I don't know, I have not seen that discussion and I, I'd certainly be interested if others have. I haven't seen th that discussion um, so explicitly out there in Russian military literature. So I can't, I can't answer your question as to, you know, the debate. Um, one other thing I would say, though, is if you if you look back to the slide, which you probably can't now, but if you look back to the slide on the Russian actions um, that Berenuk, that was from Berenuk um, in 2009, that they were sort of envisioning to disrupt the aerospace attack, um, there's certainly long long range attacks against sort of traditional hard military targets, um, and so I that's why I think this is just a theory that. It's, it's some theory and some practice, but it's still sort of in the theoretical level at some point in some ways for the Russians are trying to hash out how do we develop a, a plan and a strategy that most effectively uses the, the resources that we have. And I don't think it's, it's crystal clear yet um, how it all works together, um, how, how, they're, how they're targeting these things, what's the priority and so forth. I'd be, I'd be interested if others have, have thoughts on that. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, and then we have a, have a question from, from let's go, Colonel Simo Peso. Could you please? Okay, okay, it's already. It's, it's answered, I, I think, already. Yes, Clint answered it greatly. Uh, okay. Then we have a question from from University of, of Yugascula, where a student uh, of, of political research is asking about, I will say, it, uh, based, uh, is it directed to my, Michael especially, based on your knowledge and understanding, how much did the Soviet Union's leadership in the 80s believe to the credibility of of Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, Star Wars nuclear missile defense system. Uh, uh, did the Soviet Union believe that the SDI nuclear missile defense system 
was a possibility to become a functional system and negate the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal, or did they at the same time uh, understand uh, that the SDI was not a realistic project with that technology of that time? Okay, I'm happy to take that on. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, SDI. I would say that one uh, one of the Soviet Union's long-standing concern had been a parallel missile defense race alongside a nuclear arms race, a tactical theater and strategic level, and that they had always sought to avoid this via the 1972 ABM treaty. On technical feasibility, I think that this was pretty well debated, and undoubtedly many people believe that SDI was meant to be a US instrument of coercion uh, against the Soviet Union by essentially uh, challenging the credibility of Soviet nuclear deterrent. Back then, much the same was written and conceived uh, about US doctrinal writing on prospects of limited nuclear war, right? This is what Agarkov and other people were saying, the limited nuclear war is sort of uh, an American canard that's not realistic and it's meant to actually distract people from the nuclear arms race and on that new limited nuclear war was fundamentally a fantasy, which is pretty ironic because you see, um, you see history kind of rhyme and, and, and rhyme quite a bit in terms of people's conceptions on the prospects for limited nuclear war uh, and damage limitation strategies. But back to SDI, uh, yeah, they were concerned. I mean, I, I don't believe that Gorbachev fundamentally would have um, would have proposed a sort of near complete disarmament in Reykjavik to Reagan, and SDI would have ended up essentially as one of the hangup points if that wasn't the case, right? Because Soviet Union at the local level asked the United States to give up SDI, and Reagan didn't want to, right? Um, so to me, it, it it sort of it remained a concern uh, in terms of not that SDI itself was realistic, but sustained U.S. investment in missile defense could eventually lead to breakthroughs. That's always been the Russian concern. That led to a lot of Russian investments in these asymmetric counters because fundamentally they couldn't bank on the fact that after 20, 30 years of investment, uh, the United States would not reach some technological breakthrough in missile defense. Little do they know the nature of our defense procurement, but that's a separate story. <laughs> Thank you. And then I would give the floor to Rod Thornton. Could you please tell a question yourself, in order to, uh, that also in the YouTube people can listen to it. Uh, we will. Yeah, sorry, my, my point there. Uh, thank you, um, Bendy. Uh, my point was basically that. that Putin himself has re-emphasized only in a speech in sorry, in December the importance to the Russian military and to Russian strategy of uh, the nuclear arsenal of Russia. So he was basically saying that it, it's your first priority to the military. Your first pri priority is to is to make sure that the uh, the high combat readiness is maintained of the nuclear arsenal. So uh, it's just uh, it wasn't a question; it was just a point. Uh, I just thank both uh, presenters for very good presentations. Uh, thank you while I'm on screen. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I would just follow up on that just to just to reiterate. Um, yeah, Putin. Putin also gave a speech where he said that you know Russia's uh, national security was assured for the next for decades to come as a result of their modernization efforts and of strategic nuclear weapons. So again. Just to hammer it home, not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to insert uh, some kind of narrative that Russia just doesn't care about their nuclear weapons, not at all. Um, but we're talking, we're talking about decades into the future here. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to insert the narrative that everything in Russian military development thought really stems from Agarko. Only most of it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But. <laughs> but, but <laughs> But I am trying to subvert your thinking that it's all fiction to Kaczewski, these other people. Garkov, I do think, is essential to understanding the, the origins of the more contemporary developments. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. And, and then we have a question here in the chat that uh, Juha Kukkola, who is serving at the moment as, in the, as, a, as a student in the General Staff Officers Corps here in our university, and he's, he's asking, especially for Clint Reach, that what could be the relationship between asymmetry actions and means or operations and the correlation of forces and means? Are the Russian trying to incorporate asymmetry into the uh, correlation of forces and mean calculations? What could be the role of asymmetric actions or means for the Russian deterrence in the future? Um, so, good question. I've, I've actually gone... I've actually gone all over the place on this question about indirect action and asymmetric actions and these kind of things. And what are the Russians talking about when that, cause they talk about it in sort of a vague way. You know, they say, um, we're the technologically inferior side. Um, so we have to, and we're, and we don't have the economic resources. So we have to come up with asymmetric actions to level the playing field. Um, and I kind of had all, all kinds of thoughts about what that might mean. Uh, I think I think it does mean in in peacetime, um, you know, going after things like societal cleavages and so forth within Western societies um, to weaken them in some way. But in terms of war fighting and deterrence, um, what, what I've settled on is that I think it's this discussion of going after the enablers that allow the system to function with your conventional precision munitions that that I think that may be what the Russians are referring to, like in Kartopolov's speech in 2015 when he talked about this. Um, I think it's it's those types of actions um, that and having the capability to conduct credibly conduct those types of operations is sort of part of their thinking on on non-nuclear deterrence and asymmetric actions. It's not necessarily any sort of magical sort of uh, you know, futuristic type of thing. I mean, I think it, that's, that's my view anyway. Um, and so in terms of correlation of forces, what that could mean is, is that your munitions requirements are less. Um, you know, if you're not expending 150 missiles going after an air base, but are expending less to go after targets that you think that the Russians think are sort of more consequential for the overall aerospace operation, um, or that you think might have a more psychological effect on the leadership, um, that could that could reduce the amount of munitions you might need um, to to do the job if you're the Russians, and it, and it would be technically asymmetric, I think. If I can briefly pitch in, maybe uh, on top of Clint's great answer, um, my sense of it is just uh, I think there's there's two different things. One's asymmetry and one is asymmetric actions. And so the person was clearly asking about asymmetric actions versus asymmetry in Russian military thought, which is more of a competitive strategy-like conversation, right? Whereas asymmetric actions, um, if, if you think about symmetry conflicts, okay, one side has a conventional intervention, the other side has a conventional intervention, or one side's engaged by proxies and the other side's engaged by proxies and the like. Um, to me, kind of how I split asymmetry and indirect to, because they're both a bit, in, a bit of a nebulous and, and they overlap at times. Asymmetry is, you know, if the opponents engage in conventional warfare, then you engage in various forms of indirect warfare in the conflict, right? So then you're the one that goes in with proxies and, and uh, political subversion and the like, uh, es essentially to exhaust them. You don't intervene conventionally alongside them. Alternatively, if like in Syria, your opponent is engaged in forms of proxy warfare and arming these different groups, then you uh, intervene with aerospace forces and you kill everyone by bombing them via conventional means. So this is kind of asymmetry that if one side takes one strategy, you then take an asymmetric strategy. Um, and the one that's indirect, I think, is more of a basically a conversation that your forces and opponent forces are not in direct conflict contact in the conflict space, right? So if one side's intervening in a particular conflict, you're intervening in that conflict too, but you're doing it in such a way that your forces are not meeting. Okay, so if they're already deployed, you're likely to go, you're likely to intervene in a very different manner. That way uh, you are not in direct conflict or contact with, uh, with their military forces. 
Thank you. Are there any questions right here? There's one comment. I, I, I'd like to ask both of you, uh, just, just uh, uh, the, the, about the relations. How, how, how does the objective for, for the forces or, or, the, or the military power in, in Agarkov's time and, and now the current Russian military, how does it affect to the, to the ideas which, which Agarkov mentioned or, or how it, does it affect to the correlation of forces nowadays? What is the meaning of the objective or the goal of the military? Uh, at the moment, while, while knowing that now, now as, as Clint mentioned, that the, that the non-military non uh, effects are, are in a growing tendency. So, so in relative terms, it will squeeze the, the conventional and the nuclear capabilities. Uh, and, and, but, but anyway, how does the objective is, is uh, de dealt with in, in this uh, in, in your research, C could you please elaborate that a bit? There's a question on non-military means? I might have missed the very beginning. Maybe Clint, you got a sense of it. Yeah, well, well, knowing that, that, that during the Agarkov time that the, the, the uh, group of forces and with a very high readiness capabilities, and, and we know that the objective was in two weeks reach the channel of aim, but, but nowadays the, the, the idea is somewhat different. But still the correlation of forces as calculations are there, more or less the same, but how does the objective affect to the, to the calculations? Well, I could, Mike, I can go first. I mean, I think this, this issue of the, the force disposition and the theater is something I've, I've thought a lot about and the challenge. So it, it, gives, it gives the Russians both opportunities and it creates challenges. Um, the, and I'm thinking when I say force disposition, what I mean is that there are no longer these prepared uh, defenses right, along, right across from the Russian border that they would need to break through, surround force groupings, and destroy them and things like that. And the primary operation is sort of the, the strategic land offensive supported by naval and air forces and air defense. Um, so the theater is different now in that sense that the, the forces are arrayed uh, much differently. Um, and so it does raise a question about um, Russia's ground forces. And so you have permanent ready ground forces. Um, if they were to seize territory um, right across from the Russian border, then that becomes, in my view, more of an occupation than it does a military fight, um, at least from the perspective of the ground forces. Um, so it creates opportunities for Russia in the sense that it has this territory that's potentially, that's arguably undefended, uh, that they, they could take if they felt like they had to, if there was some, some political reason for doing so. Um, but it also, it still forces them to engage in this sort of non-contact war because all of the military potential of NATO, or at least a large portion of it, is either in Western Europe or in the United States. Um, so regardless of, of sort of what Russia does in sort of the initial period on the ground, it's still going to have to tackle this challenge uh, of disrupting a, a NATO counterattack, let's say, that's largely based on aerospace forces. Um, so that's sort of how I think about the, the military aspect of the, of the theater. I'm not sure if that's where you're going with the question or not, but. Yeah, I, I will add just the Clint's answer that it really depends on the type of war you're talking about, right? So the military's job is to answer the prospect of armed conflict, a conflict like in Chechnya, let's say, local war, a Russia-Georgia or Russia-Ukraine war, a uh, regional or a large scale war that involves multiple theaters, even multiple powers, and of course, a strategic nuclear exchange. And much of that uh, begs the question of what do you think would be the Russian political objective in a war, right? And what we typically tend to discuss on a hypothetical war with NATO. So naturally it would not be to conquer all of Europe, um, 
or uh, to head to the English Channel as fast as possible, right? And so to me, that, that, that all comes to consideration. There isn't one easy answer. It depends on the type of war. Different wars have pre create different contexts with different types of objectives. And the military has to deal with the range of these fights. Yes, it may have to prioritize large scale regional first, but it has to deal with a spectrum of these prospective fights that, that doctrinally involve the application of different instruments, both for deterrence and for war fighting. Um, and, and they create different considerations. Part of the challenge, I think, dealing with NATO is both the fact that the war could initially have fairly limited scope or more importantly limited to local stakes and that has big advantages but also has big disadvantages for NATO as well um, in in terms of uh, the stakes and for all the different countries that may have to be involved in a NATO coalition. Yep, thank you, thank you. And there is, yeah. If there are no other questions, yeah. I could maybe ask a one, one um, sort of a uh, reflection on the discussion. And this is a question for both, but uh, primarily for uh, Clint. Uh, if we kind of simplify things now, we can think of the correlation of forces as a theory or method for calculating how much hardware you need to get to your objective in a way. But Russians are also famous for another theory, which is theory of reflexive control that, that in a way gives an ideas or models for calculating um, the sort of uh, information, informational objectives or targets uh, of of the of the uh, adversary system, political system. So my question is: uh, Are these two uh, spheres of thought, in a way, integrated? Have you seen um, any uh, discussion on 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 reflexive control theory in the context of your your study. Thanks. So I, I wouldn't say that they're, at least in the literature, um, directly related. The way that I would say that they're direct related intuitively is that reflexive control is all about um, convincing your adversary to basically do what is in your interest, right? So you want to crawl inside their head, think about how they think about what makes them tick and then take actions that you think will play on their weaknesses um, or biases or whatever in order to get them to do what you want. In the, in the research that I've done, reflexive control is really about convincing the adversary that any conflict with Russia would result in sort of consequences that, that would not, that would outweigh any potential benefit, right? And so the Russians will sometimes reflexive control, and this is something I've seen in the Russian literature, reflexive control is Putin making a statement about how Russians are prepared to be martyrs if you know, there were ever to be a war with NATO. I think he's, he's basically sending the message that there, are, there is no sort of military solution to the Russia problem uh, for NATO. And so, you know, don't even consider it. And, and so having, I guess where a correlation of forces comes in is that you have to have the capability to make those types of statements credible. Um, and it's the problem, the credibility problem for Russia before was if our only answer is to nuke you, no matter what the, the situation might be, uh, then that's not enough. Um, we need to have credibility down down the sort of escalation ladder um, that will, will allow our attempts at reflexive control to be more effective, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. That makes a lot of sense, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, this was, there is no, no further questions. So, so on behalf of, of the, let's say the central committee of, of the, organizing orchestra I, I would like to thank all, all the speakers today uh, the speakers last last week and and, and uh, 
all the attendees and participants who have been uh, raising questions and, and, and making comments and, and watching the, our, our seminar. And, and for the speakers and, and, and participants, just to a uh, short remark that, that we will be sending a, a, a short letter of information where is uh, ask a, a small feedback on our seminar and I, I ask you kindly to 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 share a few moments to to answer the few questions we are presenting and, and there is some other information too about the future future uh, let's say doings what what we have to do before the 8th of, of April and I say thank you, and, and, and thank you. I have the pleasure to invite our superior, the, the uh, chief of, of the Department of Warfare in our university, Colonel Petteri Kajamma, to make final remarks and, and closing words. Petteri, please. Thank you, Petteri. Good afternoon, all. Oh, actually, it's not afternoon. It's already evening here in Helsinki, and it's dark outside and, and snow, so the picture is a little bit fake, but it's good anyway. Uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, very interesting day, and especially for those who survived with us until the end. Uh, on the behalf of the uh, Department of Warfare, I'd like to thank uh, all those very excellent views and uh, professional presentations during two virtual days. Today, today we started with fear and then shifted more closely to the focus of the seminar, uh, the essence of the Russian deterrence. We have heard and discussed about the deterrence in all of its forms. We have also debated what, Russia, what, what is Russian view of war and how Russia has changed its perception to deterrence. I could say some old, some new, some borrowed, some blue. I'm very satisfied not only the results of this seminar, but also how we reached the wider audience. Last week and today, we have had uh, uh, tens of registrated persons who followed uh, live broadcasts and at the same amount of people via YouTube channels. In addition, we have had more than 1,000 subscribers in YouTube so far, and numbers are growing. For us, I mean teams, and especially those who are working in the National Defense University, Russia is a permanent and keen point of interest. As you are very well aware, Finland has uh, 1,300 kilometers or 800 miles common land border with Russia and not so bright history with that neighbor. Without anything else, this will maintain the pursuit. As our rector, uh, Major General Kallio said last week, Russia is one of two focus areas of the research in the NDU's strategy for 2025. We are using our small but efficient resources to fulfill tasks, tasks given by the strategy. And we think that international cooperation is vital for us. The understanding of Russian interests and geopolitical goals are one of the main focuses of our work. We still remember what Joseph Stalin taught uh, to the Finnish delegation in Moscow prior to the Winter War uh, 1939. He said, we cannot do anything about geography, neither can you. But above that, my opinion is that our work should also include the Russian mindset and the way of thinking on the strategic and operational level, as well as training, doctrine and capabilities they have. That part was covered well by our speakers. In the end of this annual Russia seminar, I'd like to thank all prominent speakers for the excellent presentations and for keeping our interest on. In addition, I'd like to uh, show my appreciation to the organizing team, the Russian study group and uh, technicians for arranging everything. Finally, a huge thank to you all for participation.
the publication of this seminar will be ready after the first week of April. It will consist articles from our brilliant speakers. And the next Russia seminar of the Finnish National Defense University will take place in February 2022. And it is planned to have both a physical seminar here in Santa Hamina military facility and virtual one like today. In the next seminar, we will dive more deeply to the military means of Russia and political control behind that. Save a date and stay tuned. Once again, thank you all. Stay safe. This seminar is closed.